Hi guys, hope everyone's doing well. This video is for my Wednesday classes. As we talked about last week, classes are running on a Monday schedule this Wednesday. So instead of having a Zoom meeting, you guys can watch this video on your own time. So to start, I'm working on grading your profiles. I'm hoping to be done grading all of it by Friday. And also in terms of your proposals that you're posting for homework on the discussion board, I'm gonna go through tomorrow. I'm recording this on Tuesday, so I'll go through tomorrow and uh, read everyone's proposals and I'll just make a comment on everyone's uh, saying the proposal is approved and if I have any feedback for specific people, I'll give it. So you can take a look out for both your grade for the profile and your feedback on the proposal for the call to action. Okay, goals for the day. We are going to uh, talk about the opinion piece that we read for homework and also talk about how to find sources for your uh, upcoming call to action paper. So in terms of the opinion piece, I tried to make it uh, about transit so that we can have a bit of a theme between the MLA research paper we read last week and the opinion piece we read for this week but you'll notice that some of the features are quite different across the two genres. So I've made a, an annotated version of what you read for homework with some comments. Uh, I'll also post a, a version of it on Blackboard in the announcements so that you'll have it to look at, but I wanna go through those annotations together. So let me make this a little bigger. Okay, common elements for you guys to take notes note of in terms of uh, opinion pieces. They don't have a thesis. Instead, they lay out the problem first and then explain the solution and how it would be achieved. So keep in mind for this call to action, you guys are writing about an issue in a community of your choice and based on research, a solution for it. So you don't have to have, if you're writing an opinion piece, that thesis main idea sentence at the end of the first paragraph. Uh, second big thing, they use sources by integrating them with hyperlinks. So there's no works cited page, there's no MLA, but it does use sources and I'll show you how that works. Uh, they use shorter paragraphs than MLA papers do and writers have more freedom in terms of tone and voice. They can be more casual than research papers. Okay, so some notes to share with you guys. So the title of this article was Free Transit Isn't Enough, Transportation Needs to Be a Right. So I talked about in my note how the titles of opinion pieces often give away the whole, the whole answer, what they're looking for. So this idea that transportation needs to be a right is the solution uh, to the issue of uh, lack of access to transportation that this article brings up. And it talks about in detail what that means for transit to be a right. They talk about the idea of universal basic mobility is, is what they get at later in the opinion piece. So looking at how it opens, uh, this piece was written around the time of one of the big uh, democratic debates this year. So they started with a quote to draw in the readers as we're seeing across genres, that first moment of getting re the reader engaged is so key. And then we see here that they are starting to use sources. So everything that's underlined is a source. So in opinion pieces, what they do when they use sources is the readers reading along and if they wanna sort of fact check or learn more about what the, um, the author is saying, they can just click on the link. And here, for example, it's talking about universal childcare and how candidates supported it. So if I wanna learn more about that, or I wanna confirm that the author is using sources, then I can click on this link and learn more about how the, each of these candidates wanted to have universal childcare. Right, so if you yourself want to add hyperlinks to a piece, here's how you do it. So say for example that I wanted to make a hyperlink out of this freedom dividend. 
I wanted one of my sources to be something that people could click on to learn more about this. So you're going to highlight it. And then there's this little link in, um, in the menu that looks like a paper clip to me. I'm going to click insert link. And then he <clears throat> here's where I'll type in or paste uh, the name of the source, the URL for the source. Just as an example for you guys, Google tries to guess what you want to link. So I'm just going to click this to show you how it works. And I click apply. And now I have a hyperlink there. So once again, all you do is highlight, click this little insert link button, add the link, and then click apply. And then you've got the link to the source. So that's how opinion pieces use their sources, is that instead of it using MLA, they hyperlink things. So we see in terms of the organization of this piece that so far the piece has acknowledged that there's this problem with transit and in particular that there's problems with cities that have tried to implement a fare free or reduced fare public transit. So they ask this question, but are the discounted transit programs that attempt to serve these communities succeeding? And basically they lay out the idea in their opinion that no, these transit, um, these transit systems and the way that um, they offer reduced and free fare is not working. So we have a, a fuller understanding of the problem here. And then we have this short paragraph here. Simply making transit free won't solve all American cities' problems around job access and economic mobility, which is why we need to think about a comprehensive national public program that makes transportation a human right. So this is where they've spent about half of the uh, piece, uh, the opinion piece so far explaining the problem. They're saying, okay, we need to do something different. And they're signaling to the reader that they're going to start a new part of the opinion piece that lays out the solution to this problem. And that solution is universal basic mobility. So what is universal basic mobility? They go on to explain it. They spend the rest of the article explaining what it is and how it would work. So they're talking about examples of places where this idea is already sort of taking root, like in Portland, for example. And then they talk in this paragraph about how this would work. So universal basic mobility being the idea that what if we put all on one pass, like buses, subways, uh, bikes, car rental, and uh, also the idea of a robust walking network as well. And here, when we get to this part, I've highlighted the sentence, now how do we pay for it? And it's like they're acknowledging that people might be wondering, people might have this question in mind. Last week when we read the MLA research paper, the student did a kind of similar move uh, in which they said, they had counter argument paragraphs. Some people may say this, some people may say this. This person's doing the same thing. They're saying, okay, I can see that you're wondering how we're gonna pay for this. And then they spend the rest of the paragraph talking about ways that it could be funded. For example, uh, investing less money in highways. Then they bring in the presidential race here, sort of linking us back to the beginning and the debates and how people in power can make this problem uh, go away, how they can implement solutions. You saw this as well in the paper we read last week, um, how the student was talking about uh, the New York State budget. And then finally, right at the end of the second to last paragraph, they have this really good description of what universal basic mobility is. Imagine a single card or an app that like in many other countries could unlock train rides, bus rides, bike rides, scooter rides, van rides, car rides, anywhere in the nation. Now imagine that we might achieve, what we might achieve when those services are not only funded adequately, but also free for everyone to use. So if this were an MLA research paper, this could probably be the thesis, right? Um, but we're seeing in an opinion piece that it's more of a linear explanation of here's the problem, here's a long explanation of the problem, here's a solution, here's all the ways that it could work. So that's the difference, one of the major differences in these two genres.
And to add a little bit more for you guys about the differences between the two so that you feel really good when you pick which genre you want to write in. Um, just a, a, a chart with an explanation of common elements of MLA research papers versus opinion pieces. So an MLA research paper has a thesis at the end of the first paragraph that indicates what the solution to the issue will be. So what we saw when we read the opinion paper last week was uh, the idea that students with good grades should get a free Metro card. That was the thesis. Um, they use MLA style, so they use in-text citations. Um, anytime you use someone else's ideas, whether that's a direct quote or summarizing the whole piece or paraphrasing, which is just um, putting like a single sentence in your own words. Remember, they say, I say. So after you use a quote, explain in your own words why it relates to the thesis. So you never want to leave a quote dangling, meaning that you never want to like end a paragraph on someone else's words, or you never want to have multiple quotes in a row. You always want to include a quote and then explain why it relates to your big idea with, with MLA papers. Um, quotes from sources should be about a sentence or less. Please don't use black quotes in a paper of this length. So a black quote is like a long chunk quote. Um, if you are writing a book, black quotes can be really great, but in a shorter like three to five page paper, uh, you definitely don't need black quotes. I want to see more of your own words. If you really like a black quote from the piece, try paraphrasing it, putting it putting single sentences in your own words, and then maybe pull the best quote to actually uh, use the exact words. Uh, additionally, MLA papers have longer paragraphs, more standardized length in term of terms of paragraphs, and they're more formal. Um, in general, because historically, with these kinds of papers, people are publishing research and studies, um, so there's less room for experimentation with tone and voice and more focus on getting the data out to people. But of course, like we saw last week, there is room to show your personality in an MLA paper. And for opinion pieces, they don't have a thesis. They lay out the problem in depth and then the solution in depth, one and then the other. You can think about this probably if you were um, telling a story or saying something out loud, you'd probably go linear. You'd say, here's a problem, here's the solution. An opinion piece as a form of journalism is, is like this, right? Uh, opinion pieces cite sources by adding them as hyperlinks. The writing makes a claim and the hyperlink backs up the claim. So if you give like a statistic or, um, you know, a piece of information that you found from your sources, then you would include the hyperlink there. Uh, opinion pieces generally have shorter paragraphs which is an oppor and an opportunity to play more with your tone, your voice, and more likely to use pictures, single spacing, varying font sizes, similar to what you guys saw in the profiles. So for this call to action paper, whether you choose to write an MLA paper or an opinion piece, you need three total sources at least. You can have more, um, but at least three. So you need to have one scholarly source and two general sources. Scholarly sources are studies and articles published within academia, and you can find them on the City Tech Library databases on Google Scholar. I'm going to show you the City Tech databases. Uh, I'm also going to show you Google Scholar. I personally favor Google Scholar, and I'll tell you why in a second. And then general sources, these are things like newspaper articles, podcast episodes, books, TED Talks, etc. I wanted to briefly share this infographic about fake news uh, because I think it's really useful for research and also just in our personal lives, parsing through all of the information that we get on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first suggestion that they have is considering the source. So thinking about um, where the source is published and like what seems to be the mission of the website where it's hosted. You can also think when considering the source about looking into who funds um, who funds this website or this news organization. Uh, for example, uh, NPR, National Public Radio, is increasingly funded by big companies like uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook. So it's a bit of a conflict for, of interest for them to report on, for example, labor practices in Amazon warehouses because they get money from Amazon, right? So you want to think about where's the money coming from? How is this, uh, how is this outlet staying afloat financially? Um, secondly, 
keep in mind that headlines can um, be clickbaity and outrageous. You want to read beyond the headline and see what the article has to say. Check out the author. Um, who are they? What's their background in relation to the topic that you're researching about? Um, how have they experienced it or what do they know about it? If you can find their Twitter, that's often a really good place to see um, what their background is. And um, there's other ways too. you know, of course, you can look at their author bio and stuff like that. But check out the author. Who are they? Um, do they use supporting sources? So sometimes you might encounter a piece of writing that makes a lot of um, seemingly factual claims but doesn't have any hyperlinked sources or doesn't have any doesn't have any list of sources that they use or doesn't mention any sources at all right um if they don't have if they're not backing up their sources that should be a signal to you to look elsewhere as well to confirm the things that they're saying take a look at the date um thinking about is this an older piece that's being sort of recirculated online is it a joke this could be like there's um, satire websites like The Onion, for example, um, or Reductress that post articles that are a joke, but sometimes they circulate on social media and um, can be, especially if you're scrolling by them, can be viewed as true. So um, take a look to see if it's a piece of satire. Check your biases and also the biases, biases of the person who wrote it. Um, like we've talked about in this class, there's the idea of critical reading meaning that you know that you're a person with opinion, an opinion and the person who wrote the source is a person with an opinion. Um, so thinking about how does their opinion sort of uh, color the way that they wrote it and how does your opinion color the way that you perceive that information. And then finally asking the experts. So you can always check in with a librarian or a fact checking website to see if something that you're looking at is uh, real or not real or to what extent you should pay attention to it. Okay, going back to, actually, I'm going to go forward. Okay, so how do you search? You want to find your sources. How do you do it? You want to use keywords. Um, so start with your research question and then pull keywords from it. So from your, uh, your proposals that you guys wrote, you wrote a research question in there. That's really key because that's the main thing that you want to know about. Um, so for example, I made a sample research question here, imagining that I was the student who wrote the research paper that we read last week. So I wrote the question, how can we help CUNY students get access to free transit? The keywords that I pulled directly from my question are CUNY students and free transit. And I put free transit in quotation marks so that it keeps those words together. Otherwise, it might search free and transit separately and not give me what I'm looking for. Now I can expand the keywords too. So maybe I look at CUNY students and I say, okay, maybe I'll find stuff that's related to all college students in general. Um, because if another college has given students free transit, then in your paper, you could say, well, this college has done it. Why can't CUNY do it? Um, maybe from free transit, you would get words like transportation, MTA, subway as possible search terms. And then thinking about related concepts. So this is like, okay, if I'm thinking about three, free transit, that definitely has to do with the budget. So maybe I think about searching things about the budget or about people uh, who have a lot of power in New York, like Cuomo. So now I have this list of words, or you can also do it as like a mind map. Um, and you can then take these words and start to plug them in um, on Google or on the databases or on Google Scholar so that you can start to find your sources. So I'm going to start with uh, the City Tech Library databases. So what I've done for you guys is I've included it as a hyperlink in the slides. So if you want, you can go directly from the slides and get to the databases. And I've just uh, linked the A to Z database list here. So the way that academic publishing works is that um, a person will publish an article, that article goes in a journal. The journals go in databases and then the school buys access to the database. So they buy the right, the, you know, the subscription to get all of these articles. And as you can see, all of the databases, um, there's so many of them, right? Like this is just the A's. 
and they're sorted by different topics. So we have like African American music reference, agriculture collection, American Chemical Society. Those all include things based on different topics, but then you have these larger databases as well, like Academic Search Complete, uh, which puts together a bunch of writing across different disciplines and topics that you can um, you can search for pretty wide responses. So to get to this, if you're on the main City Tech page, one thing you can do, of course, is that there's a search bar here. So you can search uh, articles and then just type your search terms here. What I like to do is go find research guides and then go to the A to Z database list. And then usually I go to academic search complete from there. But I also want to tell you guys about Google Scholar. So what Google Scholar does is it takes all of the stuff that City Tech owns across these different databases and puts them all in one place for you. The only thing that you have to do is link up your Gmail to the school so that you can get access. Because if you don't link up your Gmail to the school, um, you're not going to be able to get access to these links. You're not going to, you can see the title, but you can't click on it and read it. Okay, so I'm on Google Scholar right now. To, in order to link up my Gmail to my school, I have to click on these three lines. Click settings. Click library links. And then I've already done this with a previous class, but what I can do is type city tech, search it, And then these will pop up. So I select both of these, click save. And now uh, I'm linked up to the school's databases. So now I can start to search. Uh, so let's see, I'll search um, CUNY free transit. And then I can start to look at uh, titles of sources. Now, just because uh, you don't get anything in your initial search that looks good doesn't mean that it's not there. You may just need to try a different combination of keywords. And keep in mind that people may not have written exactly what you're talking about. You may not find sources that are exactly related, but if you can find similar sources, then you can apply that idea to what you're talking about. So say, for example, I find about... Um, another college system that does free transit for all students and I'm writing a paper about how I want that. I can cite that source and say, well, if this college can do it, why can't we? You know, even if it's not exactly the same, I can build the bridge. Um, we also saw this in the Rough Ride paper that we read where he connected like psychology concepts to free metro cards. He built the bridge. Okay, so I'm scrolling through, I'm looking at the titles. Hmm. So I'm seeing that this one is about ASAP, and I know that ASAP provides free Metro cards. So this might be interesting, right? Over here on the right side, I can see stuff that I have access to through PDF. So I'll click on it, see what I can get. And lo and behold, I see the study, right? I'm gonna go back and do the same on some other pieces and just sort of trawl through my results and see um, what kind of information I get, looking widely at first. Now, an important thing is that you want to preview the scholarly sources that you read, meaning that you don't have to read everything that you uh, find that's scholarly um, or that's general when you're just trying to determine uh, whether or not it's a good pick for you. So previewing some strategies that you can use are reading abstracts, reading introductions, looking at conclusions, and also scrolling through the whole article and noticing those headings and subheadings because that's gonna let you get a good understanding of what are the major ideas of this piece. And sometimes you'll find like, oh, the title made it seem like it would be useful to me, but it's not actually useful to me. So you can save some time by previewing. 
Okay, and then once you pick an article that you know you want to use as a source, then you can read it fully. All right, so what I want to do now is uh, we've been talking about finding sources because next week you have a little assignment that's um, in preparation for you to write this call to action paper and it's an annotated bibliography. Some of you may have written annotated bibliographies in other classes. Um, basically what an annotated bibliography is, is you can think of bibliography is list of sources, um, annotated is notes. So it's a list of sources you want to use with like a paragraph underneath explaining uh, a summary of the source and why you think it's useful to your research. Essentially this little project is, um, it's helping you get ready to write the paper. So, ooh, I just realized I, I only added it for my Tuesday class. I'm gonna show the assignment sheet from there. It's the same assignment sheet for everybody. I just forgot to upload it to my Wednesday classes. I'll have this up by the time you watch this video. Okay, so it'll look like this for you. I'll say annotated bibliography. So you'll go submit papers and projects, annotated bibliography. Um, so for this assignment, you'll conduct research for your call to action paper and write about three sources that you want to use in your paper. Two sources should be general and one should be scholarly. And I've attached an annotated bibliography that you can use as a sample. I made notes on it so you can see what I'm looking for. So let me open this up. This is a student who is doing the same assignment that you guys are doing. Um, this first comment is just explaining what I said about what annotated bibliographies are. In general, annotated bibs should be Times New Roman font, 12-point 12, uh, 12, 12 font, and then double-spaced. Okay, and then my highlight for this first annotation is, notice how the list of sources is alphabetized by the first word of the source. Every line after the first line is indented. So in terms of indentations, it's the opposite of a paragraph. I don't know why, this is just what MLA does, so you have to indent these lines. And as you can see here, there's three sources total, and you indent by the first word, so we have A, advice, G, and S. So what the student did is she has her MLA style citation, and then she has a short paragraph underneath that explains a summary of the source and why she thinks it'll be useful to her research. Now notice this first citation doesn't have an author, so she just used the title of the page. But this next one does have an author. More often than not, they will. So it's last name, first name, the name of the work, where she got it from, the date, and then uh, the link to the source. The link is important because you're doing all of this so that a reader can find your source. All right, so that's what you're doing, guys. You're writing three citations for three sources that you think you wanna use. You're not bound to use these sources. Like if you realize that once you start writing the paper that one of the sources actually doesn't work for you, that's fine. But um, make sure that you're, it's, the, the whole point of this assignment is to get you the research that you need first. And then uh, next week, we'll talk about how do we turn this research into a paper? And then um, you'll only focus on turning the research into the paper instead of uh, like a mad dash where you're like researching and writing um, all at one time, like quickly before the deadline. Um, so this is the annotated bib. I want to talk some more about MLA style because you may be listening to this and uh, want to know more about MLA. So my thoughts about MLA. Um, use your resources, no need to memorize MLA stuff. Um, and in this class, I also don't want you to stress too much about MLA. I just want you to be working on it and practicing it. Um, so the annotated bib, like my thought is it's useful. Um, it's sort of like a preparatory step for your call to action paper. Um, but MLA can feel very daunting and I just want you to use it but not stress too much about using it for this um, up, upcoming annotated bibliography assignment. So resources. There's a lot of websites that will make MLA citations for you. Easy Bib is one of them. So um, Easy Bib basically when you open it, 
it has a list of types of sources, like books, journals, stuff like that. You'll click on whichever one is the kind of source that you're using. So say that you, um, you're citing like a page on a website. I wish this would load. Um, and then you can put in the URL or you can type the information and it'll make the citation for you. Okay, this may not load for me in the moment. Ah, here we go. Okay, yeah. So um, you choose a site, the kind of source that you have, and then uh, it'll help you build the citation. Secondly, on Google Scholar and some of the City Tech databases, um, there's often a little button that says "Cite," where you can get pre-made citations. So I'll show you that real quick. Um, so if I go to Academic Search Complete. I have to, because we're off campus, you have to use your CUNY login to get into these databases. So I'm getting into the database. I'm going to use my keywords. So say I say like CUNY. And I'm just going to click on an example and show you guys the button. So over here on the right hand side, it says site. And if I know that I want to use this, I just click MLA. And here's the citation. All I have to do is double space it. Pretty cool. Um, finally, there's Purdue OWL. So Purdue OWL is from the Writing Center for uh, Purdue University, and it's really great, and it gives you everything that you need about MLA, including how to cite all kinds of things, and an MLA sample paper that um, I love to look at on Purdue OWL, the MLA and APA um, sample papers. I use them all the time, um, like in my own writing, uh, in my Writing Center tutoring, in my teaching. Um, they're just really great. So Purdue OWL, one thing that you can do is if you use a citation generator, you can use Purdue OWL to check the citation that's been made by the website just to make sure it's correct. Um, so I linked in my slides to the MLA um, guide. It also has an APA guide. But What you can see here is that it offers a lot of different kinds of sources that you might want to cite. You guys are probably going to be using electronic sources most predominantly because we're online this semester. Um, so say, for example, that I'm citing a page on a website. Um, this might be like an article or something. So you can see the parts of the citation here. Last name, first name title of the page, uh, like who published it, the URL, and the date that it was accessed. Or you can see here, here's an example of when there's no author, you just put the name of the page in quotation marks. Sometimes what I do when I'm doing MLA is I'll just take the sample and like copy it into my document and then replace all of the information with the correct information. So for MLA, there's a lot of resources at your disposal. Um, don't feel stressed by it. Just know that there's a lot of stuff that automates this for you and that your role is using those resources and then checking to make sure that they've done it correctly. Um, some fast tips about MLA that's useful for your annotated bibliography. Um, Times New Roman 12 point font, double spaced, center works cited at the top of the page. This is also if you're doing like an MLA works cited page, alphabetized by the first word of the source and indent every line of the citation after the first line, opposite of a paragraph. Okay, so no matter whether you're writing a MLA research paper or an opinion piece for the call to action, 
you have to do this step, which is the annotated bibliography first. And the annotated bibliography has to be an MLA. Um, so you may end up like, you know, doing this in MLA, finding your sources, and then going on to write in the opinion piece genre, which is not an MLA. All right, let's see. I think that's it on my slides. Just to review the, um, the calendar. For next week, you have a reading. The reading is uh, evaluating and choosing sources. Um, I made a note here that the part about previewing a source on that starts on 326 is optional. My thought about this whole chapter is um, read it strategically, like preview it, get the information that you can get um, about how to choose sources. A lot of it is similar to what I've said in class today. And then spend most of your time um, finding your sources and working on the annotated bibliography. And just keep in mind, the annotated bibliography is a very small project, much smaller than the larger call to action paper that's due in two weeks. But the aim is that it's helping you write um, the, the call to action. It's helping you find the research. And it's like a sort of a formalized step in finding that research. Okay, so reach out to me with questions, but I'll be looking forward to seeing your annotated bibliographies um, submitted next week. And yeah, take a look out for your grades for the profile in the next couple of days. And that on the discussion board, I'm gonna approve everyone's uh, proposals for the call to action. Email me with questions and I will see you next week.